me see where I was. We did that, we did that, we did that, we did that. Uh, we did that as well. All right. So um, I always feel compelled to do this. I don't know why. Just so you remember what we were talking about. We are talking about batch unit operations that are a lot different than continuous processes uh, in terms of their operation and control. So I mentioned that in this part here that most batch processes involve executing a sequence of steps to operate the system, sequential. So instead of it being, you know, some continuous control objective, it's some sequential steps, and I gave you some examples of that. Uh, we talked about this whole um, idea of controlling. You might want to, when you're actually performing the batch, so this is involved in setting up the batch and maybe shutting down. You might want to do some control during the batch, like controlling temperature and things like that, which I showed you. I didn't talk much about this, but the whole idea here was that if you do a, um, a batch or s do some manufacturing, you measure um, how you did at the end of a run, then you can use this information to improve the next batch run. Because typically, when these batches are performed, the qu there's quality product quality measures, they're not measured till the end of the batch. So there's no way to improve the batch you're running, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but you can use certain recipes um, to try to improve the next batch given the information you get on what you just made. All right, so we're way down here um, on this kind of scheduling and planning and things like this. Okay. All right, so most batch plants, not all, but or let's say many, produce more than one product and they do it for more than one customer. So a lot of the examples... I tend to refer to in class or polymers because I've worked a lot with polymers and companies that make polymers. And so it's very common that, you know, you hear a word like polyethylene or polypropylene. Those are not all the same. <laughs> okay. Like there's lots of different kind of polyethylenes you could make in terms of the molecular weight distribution of the polymer. And then many polymers have more than one monomer. Everyone knows what a polymer is, I'm hoping at this point. So, you know, sometimes polymers have two monomers you know, like ethylene propylene, ethylene propylene uh, uh, polymers. And so then you have different amounts of ethylene, different amount of propylene, different molecular weight distribution. So each customer has um, a different re requirement in terms of what they want from the polymer. So if you're in the polymer industry, you, you negotiate contracts with, you know, companies that take the polymer and manufacture it into bottles or whatever they're interested in doing. Um, and you have to, number one, meet the product's quality specifications that they want. And number two, you have to produce, you have to deliver the amount of polymer they want, okay, under the contract. So this would be an example. Um, I just made this one up, but it's not, it's not totally ridiculous. So you might make on the order, you know, 25 products for on the order of 100 different customers. So there's a lot of, um, so it's not just about making batches. It's like, how are you going to schedule? Right, if you have all these different products for all these customers, how are you going to make sure you satisfy all the contracts by making the amount of polymer that you need um, for all these customers? So there's two things that are involved in this. Um, one is called planning, one is scheduling, okay? So um, I guess scheduling is a little bit lower level. So if you have a multi-purpose batch plant that makes these different polymers, the question is, how are you going to schedule the manufacturing of all these different um, polymers that you need to make using the equipment you have available? Okay. So they typically call these things campaigns, right? You're going to make a polymer for a certain company for a couple of days, and then you're going to make a polymer for another company. Um, and sometimes the, ho the whole plant is involved in making one product. So you can't make more than one product at a time, but sometimes you can make multiple products um, using the equipment you have, which we'll talk about. So that's scheduling. It's very important in batch and you know, discrete manufacturing. And then planning is even a higher level. Okay, this is like almost um, at an enterprise kind of level. And so this is a common problem. If you, let's say you make um, polyethylene, then you don't have one plant that makes polyethylene. You have a lot of plants that typically make it, or several plants. And you have customers all over the world. So you have to schedule which plant's going to make which product for wh what time, for how long. And you want to do this at minimal cost, obviously. Right? 
And so this, this is a whole problem of trying to figure out how you're going to run all the plant, maybe multiple plants even, to make the products that you need to satisfy the customers that you have. All right, so this just gives you some idea of what's involved in scheduling and planning. So um, this is the kind of information you're given. We'll start over here. So, you know, basically how much people demands, meaning how much you've agreed to provide. If you have inventories, which you never really want to have an inventory because it's a waste of money. Um, but, you know, do you have any materials that's to start with? And what amount of material do you need to end with? What amount of time do you have to make these? Um, what order is, what a precedence order? This would be something like, um, which customer would you like to satisfy the most? <laughs> okay. Um, how do you go about um, utilizing the available resources you have? What type of production facilities do you have? Types meaning like what products can you make? Capacities, how much can each of them make? Um, and then um, limitations on the type of equipment you have, the amounts, the rates. Like one plant be able, might be able to make a certain product, another plant can't make it. So that'll restrict what you can actually do. And then you're trying to basically determine, uh, answer these questions. Like how much are you going to make? Those are called lots or sometimes called campaigns. Batch size might for a reactor might mean the amount that you actually have in the reactor. Um, how are you going to time the different operations, which I'll show you in a minute exactly what that means. How long is each one of those unit operations going to be run? Um, where are you going to make it? What units are you going to use? Um, what particular equipment are you going to use? So on and so forth. You get the idea. So it's a big scheduling and optimization problem in principle of how you're going to do this. So this gives some a little more concrete idea. So this picture here says you've got um, three raw materials. Apparently raw material is not very useful because you don't use it. But anyway, you've got raw material A, B, which is not used in C. Um, and you have these different products that you want to make, okay, D, E, and F. And so these are different. By units, this might mean this is a certain kind of reactor. This is a different type of reactor. This is a flash drum. This is a column. It doesn't really matter for this particular um, uh, illustration here. But you can see to make, for example, product D, you need to use unit 1 and you need to use unit 2 to do that. To make um, E, you need, um, well actually, sorry, to make D you need A and C, but you only need, well you need unit 1 and 2, but to make E, you only need to use one unit 1, you don't need unit 2, okay? So you can see from something like, and this looks pretty similar over here, okay? So well, the idea here is you want to schedule how you're going to use these different units. So for example, if you're using unit, this is all sequential, you understand? You process it with unit one, and then you transfer all the material to unit two. It's not continuous. So if you're using unit two to make um, this product D, unit one is now available. It's not being used. So it'd be wise to use that now to make product E, if you, if you needed product E to be made, right? Okay, so, you know, the situation in when you manufacture chemicals is one of two things. It's either um, if the economy is good, then it's, it's a sold out situation, meaning every pound of product you make, you can make more money. That's, that's every manufacturer's dream, right? Um, if the economies are bad, you know, then you may not need to even run your plant all the time because the demand will be less. But typically, at least the plants I've been involved with are like, you know, Dow and DuPont and ExxonMobil and companies like this. They're, they're, they're running 24 hours a day, every day, right, 24-7. And so making extra material is just extra money. So, so the idea of this kind of unit is, you know, how do we take these raw materials and make them these products using these units such that we can make as much money as possible? In other words, make as much of these as, as we possibly can, okay? And so this is actually a different example. I'm just taking these out of the book, but okay. So this is a different example. It's a little bit simpler so I can illustrate what's involved. So we have some raw materials here. We're going to make three different, sorry, that'd be four products. One, two, three, and four. And they all require these three units to make them. Okay. So I don't know. This might be a reactor and this might be, um, well, this might be a mixing unit. This might be a reactor. This might be a batch distillation, so something like that. Okay. Whoops, sorry about that. And this is the amount of time each product takes in each unit. Let's say this is hours. Okay. So in other words, if you want to make 
um, product P1, it take, you have to spend 3.5 hours using unit one, this amount using unit two, this amount using unit three, okay? Even though not illustrated in this picture, you might imagine that after you use unit one to make product one, you probably have to clean it a little bit. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll get product one and product two. <laughs> okay. All right. But anyway, let's forget about that. So these are the amount of times used. And so this is, a, this is the solution to a scheduling problem. So what do you do? Well, this is the amount of time it takes to do. You got to make all, you have some amount you got to make of these. Each one is worth a certain amount of money. You have to pay for raw materials. You can pick a, you can pose a big optimization problem to solve this. Like you might say, how did someone come up with this? Well, this problem is simple enough where you can kind of conceptually see that this makes sense. But when they get really complex, right, you have 10 different units and you're making 20 different products for 35 different customers, it's intuition doesn't work anymore. So in that case, you'd solve an optimization problem. But I mean, this should conceptually make sense, right? So this is the strategy here, okay? So the strategy is, if you notice, you, you can only use one unit at a time. Like you can't use unit one to make two products at the same time. So this says, let's take unit one, make product one, okay? And then once we've used one, unit one, then we can now switch the product one to unit two, and now unit one becomes available. Now we'll, take, now we'll make product three. Um, product three also needs unit two, but it doesn't take as long. So this means that product one is not being used during that period of time, because there's nothing we can do with this material because it's still being used to make product one. But once we're done with that, then we can start using unit two to make product three, and so on and so forth. You get, you get the basic idea. So this is called scheduling, okay? And this is, um, you know, batch manufacturing, especially multi-product plants, is like a critical part of doing this, okay? Uh, so this is the last slide. This just puts it all together. So this is similar to what I showed you at the very beginning, but... Um, <coughs> all right, so we have... Let, let's start up here. Recipe management. You guys probably don't know what a recipe is, but if you make products... Like, if you're going to make a polymer, there's a recipe. A recipe means how much do you add of each of the ingredients? How much of each of the monomers? How much solvent? What temperature? What pressure? How much chain transfer agent? It's historically known. It's developed as the product is developed. You know, people have some idea of what, how to make the polymer that you want. That's called the recipe, okay? How you operate it, what are the ingredients you use to do that? That's got to be stored somewhere, right? Because each time you pull up, you got on a new product, you have to load the new recipe in and start making that particular product. You don't depend on people to remember this stuff, you know, the operators, all right? Um, so then we got the whole thing of, you know, production scheduling and optimization. That's pretty much what I told you. That involves scheduling the production, planning production, which is a higher level, and then scheduling it, and then doing the actual manufacturing, do the run-to-run -run control, and so on. Um, so this would just be a database of things like properties of the product that you want, historical production rate data, set points for the unit operations, like what temperatures and pressures, so on and so forth. Okay. So this is all, this stuff here is all at a higher level for the most part than we normally talk about, right? This is at a higher level than just controlling temperature and pressure. That kind of stuff is all down, really down here. And so for batch process control, you're mainly interested in this sequential kind of stuff with maybe some control during the batch, okay? So what am I trying to convey to you here? This is a whole different world than we talk about, okay? So if you were to go into um, batch manufacturing like pharmaceuticals, right? All pharmaceuticals are made in batches. You don't have continuous, well, unless you're at MIT because they claim to do this. But that's a little inside joke. Okay, you don't get it. All right. Um, so right, right now, all pharmaceuticals are made in batch processes. And one of the big pushes in the pharmaceutical industry is to push towards continuous manufacturing. But right, you can afford to make pharmaceuticals in batch because especially if you're the only one that makes it. If you, I don't know if you've ever bought any drugs. You shouldn't be buying drugs, by the way. Um, <laughs> I'm talking about legal drugs prescribed by a doctor. All right. Um, they're, they're expensive, right? And that's because if you make the only drug for a certain ailment, you can like charge a lot of money. And so batch processing is fine, right? Because you, you, you can charge a lot of money for each batch. But you, when things go off patent or you're making, let's say, just like aspirin or something like that, right? You, you got to make a lot of it. The profit margin is almost like a commodity chemical. So then you want to start to push maybe towards continuous. But at this point, in the pharmaceutical material processing, 
a um, lot of biotechnology is still all batch and that that's a whole different world than we've talked about so hopefully based on this leash you have some appreciation for what's involved um, again that's more conceptual that was a lecture that was more conceptual in case you're tired of conceptual we can talk about this okay I know you missed the Laplace transform so we'll get back to that here all right cascade control um, I'm not really sure why I did batch control before cascade doesn't really matter but um, so cascade control is one of the things that you'll definitely see if you go into a plant so first thing you'll see is feedback control with PID control and then the next thing you're liable to see that goes a little bit beyond that would either be feed forward control or this cascade control okay and so I'm gonna give some examples here um, we'll introduce the idea give some examples and then we'll do you know the typical analysis stuff we'll derive closed loop transfer functions from a block diagram and then I'll show you how to design controllers and then at the end which I probably won't get to I'll do a little example <coughs> all right so it's funny how things work right remember how I introduced um, feed forward control I said feedback control has some disadvantages now I'm gonna say these both have disadvantages <laughs> and then I'll go cascade control all right but so we know feedback we like we love feedback control and if you had a choice um, sorry I don't know these things are backwards that's feedback and it's down here and this is feed forward and it's up there but okay um, so feedback control we we know very well hopefully at this point and it's very effective it's very generic it works um, in a great uh, number of circumstances um, but the problem with this typically is that um, you don't do anything till something's gone wrong the great thing about this is no matter what goes wrong you can fix it but if this, devi this set point deviates from the set point then we start acting on it um, and that can cause us take a long time to get back to the set point for example especially if this process is slow okay so respond to disturbances after they've actually um, cause problems so that's the major disadvantage let's say feedback control so based on that we said well let's use feed forward control and the idea here is if we know a disturbance is going to affect us so we know the flow to the column is changing we know eventually the compositions coming out of the column will change because the flow into the column so why not just compensate for it right away so for example you could measure the flow coming into the column see that that's changed have a controller that adjusts the reboiler or reflux automatically knowing that this change is coming okay and hopefully that'll make it such that the deviations of the, the output from the set point will be less so that was the whole idea uh, behind feed forward control okay all right so this is great for counteracting the effects of one particular disturbance and this is great for doing anything else that might occur okay so we argued the combination of these two is is a really effective way to do it okay so there is another strategy that's very common which is called cascade control okay and so th again the advantage of this here it's great for rejecting this disturbance if you can measure it right you have to be able to measure it and this will reject this disturbance eventually even if you don't measure it but it might be slow so the idea is could we do something better eliminating the effect of disturbances even if we can't measure it that's kind of the idea all right and that's where a cascade control comes in so it can provide improved performance for unmeasured disturbances of certain kind that I'm about to explain to you okay so this is a picture I think I had to steal this off the web because the book didn't have any good pictures um, so it looks a little something like this um, you have you can see here you have control what they call controller A and controller B so you have two controllers here okay so you have a controller here that's responsible for controlling something called process A, whatever that is, okay? And then you have this controller here, which is really responsible for controlling that process. You can see there's a measurement of something coming out of process A and a measurement coming out of process B. The thing coming out of process B is what you really want to control. That's the thing you actually want to control, okay? but you notice we're controlling this because we're comparing it to a set point so the idea here is that by controlling this output right here it we do a better job of controlling that one this is only a means to an end we're only control trying to do this inner loop here because that's going to help us control that better and what's not shown in this picture which would be really nice if it, it were is that you can imagine some disturbances enter this inner loop because they affect this process and some enter this outer loop and affect this process so this is going to be really effective if um, 
the disturbance enters this inner loop somehow, okay? So we'll, we're gonna go through this in great detail. So, right, we have a set. So normally what would we do here if we had a system that looked like this? Here, I tell you the most common situation is process A is a valve, okay, and process B is um, the plant itself. Normally we just wouldn't have this feed, we wouldn't have this loop at all, right? This loop wouldn't exist. And so what we've done here is added this measurement and we've added the second controller here, okay? And the key thing of cascade controller, which I showed you last time, but you, we didn't really have the background at that point, is that this controller here, the main controller, if you will, provides the set point for this inner control loop. So cascade control is characterized by you have two control loops, inner one, outer one, and this outer controller provides a set point for the inner controller, okay? All right, let's see. Right, and the key thing here is that if if a disturbance enters in this inner loop somewhere, okay, like it affects this process here, I'm gonna recognize it much more quickly with that measurement right there than I will with that measurement there. That's the whole idea. So this is intended entirely to compensate for disturbances that enter this inner loop because I'm gonna be able to see them with that measurement much more quickly than with that measurement, okay? So I can counteract them with this inner loop to a large extent. I'll give you some examples in a minute, okay? And so this statement here says, particularly useful, well, you don't need to read it, <laughs> you could read it. Um, what it. What this really says is that this might be particularly useful for disturbances that are associated with um, flow through valves. This is what I'll show you in a minute. All right, so let's go through an example here. Actually before, yeah, okay, this example is fine. It's a little complex, but not too bad. I stole this from the web as well. All right. So this is the, this is the, the most common um, cascade controller, the inner loops of flow controller, okay? And you can cascade many, many things to the flow controller. In this case, it's the so-called level to flow controller, okay? So you have a tank here, okay? You aspire to control the liquid level in the tank, all right? There is flow into the tank and flow out of the tank. So the idea here is that um, the flow into the tank is some function of flow through this header and there's lots of different unit operations that take flow out of this line so the pressure of this line changes and therefore changes would tend to change the flow into the tank, okay? So you could just wait and you know, right? If this flow changes, the level will change and then you can say, uh-oh, level's changing, I should better do something. But a more effective way is to do something like this, okay? So you have this controller here, okay? And this job of this controller is simply to control the flow coming in, okay? At whatever the set point is. So it just tries to establish whatever flow it's told to establish. And then the level controller is going to determine what that set point should be. See, this is be, to be contrasted with the level controller writing directly to that valve, right? So instead of the level controller manipulating that valve directly, it manipulates the set point to this controller. And you might say, why would you do that? That seems stupid. <laughs> well, the idea here is that if there's a disturbance in like the upstream pressure, right? Valve is, the flow through a valve is the, determined by the delta P across the valve. So if there's a disturbance in the upstream pressure, it changes, the flow through the valve will change. <coughs> even for the same valve position, right? So if you have fixed valve position, Pressure up here changes, delta P across the valve changes, flow will change. If flow changes, level will change. Eventually you'll see it and you'll say, I better change the valve position, but that may take a long time, okay? So the idea here is that I, if I see upstream pressure change, I'll see flow change right here. I won't have to wait for it to change the level and I'll, I'll try to counteract that by ke keeping the flow the same, okay? That'll go a long ways to keeping the level stable. May not be perfect, but it'll, it'll be much better than just doing the level writing directly to this valve, okay? So, I guess, um, right, okay, so we got that thing there. Um, right, we got that thing there. <laughs> I said most of this, I'm just trying to see if there's anything I didn't say. Right, okay. Um, so this, this, this whole idea of flow, cascade to flow control is Ubiquitous. I've been wanting to use that word for, I don't know, a couple days now. All right, so you've got a valve here. That's as good as I can draw a valve. Okay, so you have flow through this valve. And 
you know, that's a flow meter, right? That's how you draw a flow meter. And so what we're going to do here Okay, so this is a something to flow cascade, okay? So we, we have a flow of a stream. We, okay, we're using this flow to do something, like in this case, to control the level. You might use, this might be cooling water to a jacket. It could be anything, it doesn't matter, okay? So if you want to manipulate a, a flow of a stream, and hopefully you've learned one thing about the control class, is that inevitably you manipulate flows. <laughs> Right? That's, if you just look at all the problems we've ever had, almost every manipulated input is a flow rate. Right? So in real plants, you control flows. But you don't do the following. If you want to control temperature in a reactor, the temperature controller does not determine the position of this valve directly. Right? The temperature controller determines what this flow set point should be. So anytime you're controlling a flow, there will be a flow controller. Okay? And if you want to control, use this flow to control temperature or pressure or whatever, the controller that you design is going to send a set point to a flow controller, almost always. So I'm, my argument is when you use flow to control something, which is almost always, it'll almost always be cascade. It'll always be cascaded to a flow controller for the reasons I just explained up there. Because otherwise, if you manipulate the valve directly and you have pressure changes across this valve, the valve the flow will change in some unpredictable way and it'll screw things up, right? So that, this is how we're going to do things. Or this is how things are done, I should say. Um, and so there's other types of, of cascades, certainly, but this is by far the most common one. All right, here's, a, here's another one. I think we have two other examples or maybe just one. Ah, two. Okay. Okay, let's say you have this problem. So what are you trying to do here? Well, it looks to me like you're trying to heat up an oil stream. So you want to use, I don't know if what the, you're using this oil for, but you're putting it into a furnace, you're combusting natural gas, and you're creating a hot stream to do, use for something. I'm not sure what. Okay. So the natural tendency would be, if you looked at a problem like this, okay, you should be able to say right away, the goal here is to control probably the temperature of this, maybe flow also, but you know, temperature of this stream, right? You're heating it up. You must care the temperature coming out. And it looks like I can manipulate the flow of gas. Right? I mean, you can see there's a valve there. That gives you a good hint that that's manipulable. Okay? So, the first inclination would be something like this. Well, okay, fine. Then I'll measure the temperature of this stream, and I'll send that information to a temperature <laughs> controller, and I'll compare that to what I'd like that temperature to be, and then I'll manipulate this valve. Right? So, if it's too cold, I'll put more natural gas in there. If it's, it's, if it's gotten too hot, I'll cut back on the natural gas. All right? So, th this is, you know, not unreasonable, but you wouldn't actually do it this way. You would do it this way, okay? So yeah, temperature controller, send that, temp measure temperature, send it to a controller, compare it to the set point. But instead of writing directly to this valve, you specify the set point for a pressure controller, right? You understand pressure control for gas is essentially flow control, right? Because, well, flow is directly re related to pressure. So why would I do this instead of this? is because, okay, I have this natural gas. There's an upstream pressure here. Where am I getting this natural gas? From a big, from a, I wouldn't say a pipeline necessarily, but from a pipe. There's probably lots of different unit operations, maybe even multiple plants that are using the gas out of this pipeline. This pressure will vary depending on the demand for natural gas at any given time, okay? If this demand varies here and I just keep this constant, then the amount of gas going in here will change in some unpredictable way. And the temperature, therefore, will change in some unpredictable way. And eventually, I will look at it and say, oh boy, I wish that didn't happen. The, 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 it's too cold coming out of here. I better add more natural gas. But then you understand the whole furnace is at too low a temperature. It take, might take an hour to heat it back up to the temperature you want. Okay. Over here, if this pressure changes, you'll see it right away, right there. Okay. And this controller will say, well, given a constant set point, I will work to try to keep this pressure the same. That'll tend to keep the flow going in the same. That'll t tend to make the temperature coming out the same. So, it's, so if you look at um, what might happen, you know, this should improve like the variability, right? So if this is the temperature coming out of that furnace, this is time, let's say that's the set point. Let's say you don't have cascade control, then you might, you know, have a lot of kind of variations like that coming out of the 
the um, furnace. If you have cascade control, you know, it won't be perfect, but you know, maybe you get something much more, a lot less variability by doing this, okay? All right, so there's example one. Wait a minute. Okay, so here's example two. This, this one's a little bit <laughs> confusing because I decided to throw another controller on here for our edification, but all right, so this is a reactor, right? Was there anything I missed over here? Well, I should have just said, okay, so the terminology we like to use, and sometimes I change, but this is called the primary controller or the outer controller. This is called the secondary controller or the inner controller. You can see there's two measurements here. This measurement the inner controller uses, the main measurement that the outer controller uses. And you, ha you understand that we have no inherent interest in controlling the pressure here, other than that'll help us control the temperature here, <laughs> okay? So it's a measurement that we select because we know if we control it, we'll do a better job of controlling the temperature. All right, chemical reactor. So from the looks of this reactor, it's exothermic, right? So we need to prov provide cooling to cool this reactor down. There's a jacket, okay, right? You have a jacketed reactor. You're going to put cooling water into this jacket. The cooling water is going to get heated up, obviously. And so the confusing part of this is they've decided to put it, this is not the main story over here, but I'm going to explain it. The main story is over here, but they have this circuit, right? So the idea here is you have cooling water. There's a closed circuit here where the water circulates. Why? Because you just don't want to take water and just throw it into the, into the sewage system as much, you know, like you'd like to not use so much water. So you have this recirculation loop. Obviously this can't go on forever because otherwise the cooling medium will become the same temperature of the reactor and then it won't cool. So that's not good. <coughs> so what we're doing here is we have a level controller in this. So we have a closed circuit for the cooling water. We have an inventory of cooling water that's stored in this drum. We control the level in this drum. Um, so you can see somewhere we must put cooling water into the circuit right here, right? So cooling water enters here, goes around, eventually comes out here um, so that you can you understand this will tend to reduce the amount of cooling water you use. But it's not the main story, <laughs> so, but it's there. So it's just like, okay, whatever. All right, so the main story is over here. Okay, so this is the cascade controller over here. Um, so what do we wanna do in this system? Well, we wanna, we wanna control the temperature of the reactor. So what are you gonna do? Well, you're gonna measure the temperature of the reactor. Hopefully, even though you see the picture like this, you realize there's not a thermocouple floating around in the liquid there. Um, <laughs> There's going to be a thermo well. I don't know if you've seen this in any of the unit operations in the lab, but you know, you put a thermo well on the side of the vessel and the thermocouple fits in there, right? Because otherwise it's going to get like, destroyed by the mixer, so it's not just floating around, but whatever. Temperature controller, send that information, sorry, measure the temperature, send it to a controller, compare that to the set point you want. And the normal thing you would think about doing is this controller now would write directly to this valve, right? It would determine what the cooling water should be. Right? So that's how we would normally think about it. That's normal feedback control. But what we're going to do, so what is the problem here? Well, okay, cooling water. This is plant cooling water. Where do we get it? From a big system that handles water in a plant. You understand a, a real plant uses a lot of water. You ever wondered why plants next to, a lot of plants are next to rivers or oceans? <laughs> it's because they use a lot of water. Okay. And so this cooling water can change temperature a lot during the day, okay? And so if we operate without this controller here that I'm about to explain, cooling water temperature changes, like it goes up, right? Then the jacket temperature will go up and then eventually the reactor temperature will go up and then